Dear world, I have been told by many that the releasing of this truth may pose certain challenges in my life. But there are many institutions that this truth will be viewed as disruptive to their system of profit and gains. I want to live a happy and peaceful life and I pray for longevity. Not just for me, but for our entire species. Know that I would never harm myself nor anyone else for that matter. Nevertheless, if my life has to face certain challenges so that this planet can be saved, please do not let these trials that I may have to face be in vain and pray for me as I am praying for you. Sincerely, Terrence Deshaun Howard, May 25th, 2019. Just so that it would always be known, you know, I should never walk out there alone or harm myself. So if something happens to me and someone says that um, he committed but he did, no, I would never, ever do that. Know that somebody else did that. And uh, I'm not going to allow that to happen. What you are about to encounter will challenge and potentially redefine your perception of reality. This journey will shake the very foundations of our understanding of the world. Every belief, every piece of knowledge you hold dear will be scrutinized, questioned, and potentially transformed. As we delve into this profound exploration, a veil will be lifted from your eyes, illuminating truths previously obscured, and you will begin to see the world in a new light. It is with profound respect and deep gratitude that we acknowledge Terence Howard's monumental contribution to this awakening. The book we're about to engage with is not just a collection of pages or ideas, it is a gateway to a new understanding, a testament to Terence's dedication to uncovering and sharing the truth. His decision to make this book freely available is a gift of immeasurable value reflecting his genuine desire to enlighten and empower us all. Terence Howard has devoted his life to the pursuit of knowledge, to challenging the status quo, and to seeking answers to the fundamental questions that define our existence. His work is an invitation to embark on a journey of discovery, to question the narratives we've been taught, and to open our minds to the infinite possibilities that lie beyond conventional understanding. For making this knowledge accessible to everyone, for striving to awaken humanity to a broader comprehension of our universe, we extend our heartfelt thanks to Terence. The generosity in sharing his life's work without expecting anything in return is a rare and noble act that deserves our deepest appreciation. Now. Before we delve into the groundbreaking insights of Terence Howard's work, I have to show you what Joe Rogan has to say about this remarkable individual. Terence Howard, uh, the guy who interviewed me for Rolling Stone, told me that Terence Howard is like a legitimate genius. Like he's like, you talk to the guy, the guy is absolutely brilliant. Maybe he figured it all out. Like he was using, it wasn't like nonsense talk. Right. He was like, like, oh, this is like shockingly coherent thing to say. I think it's necessary to understand just how much of a genius this man is, considering what we're about to discover. So please watch the entire video because we need to grasp this information fully. And if you think it's important, please share the video, give it a like, and comment your thoughts on this. It will help ensure the video doesn't get buried. Let's help promote his work and ideas. This wonderful individual has taken a dangerously brave decision to speak the truth. So at least this we can do. Let's share it. Thank you. I've spent 45 years searching these things out and trying to figure out what the universe really, how it really works. We will start by reading a few words from Terence Howard left in the book as a cautionary note or guidance for us all. I encourage you not to become frightened, but brace yourselves, because the things being discussed within the pages of this book will shake the very foundation of our understanding of the world. Everything that you think you know about what you know will be called into question. A tidal wave of refreshing truth is being released upon this dark and muddied world. You are about to embark upon a journey into a forbidden subject. One that tackles a question in mathematics that has never been asked publicly. It is a subject considered so taboo that not one paper or book has been written upon this topic in modernity. If the information in this book is heeded, then this species called mankind will have the keys necessary for an eternally sustainable existence. If not, 
This species will suffer the same fate as the trilobites that crawled across the ocean floor some 500 million years ago. Extinction! Our species will pass away and be remembered only for our ignorance. That is, of course, if our fossils survive long enough for a more advanced race to find them. The truth is that everyone is just afraid of this topic because of the potential consequences associated with disclosing the true value of the number 1. Also, the fears associated with exposing the inconsistencies that govern the current practices of multiplication, division, and how these are applied to science. Unfortunately, Every country in the civilized world has their economy rooted in the value that has been placed upon the number 1, and from its valuation the world calculates interest rates, salaries, tariffs, taxes, etc. All of these calculations are based upon how the number 1 is multiplied and divided. As a result, the world's math makes dollars, but it doesn't make sense. And I think it's time to start right at the very beginning and walk through walk through this thing. So the question for the Church of Truth, Love, and Consciousness and all those listening, does a dollar times a dollar equal one dollar? Or does a dollar times a dollar equal two dollars? I have never seen anywhere in the universe where an action times an action doesn't have a reaction. So now that that's why we need to discuss this and examine it and how they came up with this strange number that, which is illogical because an area, a length times a length has to have an area. So you can't have an, a one times one having equaling one because now what happened to the length times the length? It's, the area is no longer in existence. Tarrant starts by posing an intriguing question. Money can't be multiplied, or can it? A penny times a penny equals what? Since the penny is no longer based upon the hard asset of gold, and is now based upon an imaginary value that is equal to a virtual value of the integers or numbers, then it follows 1 penny times 1 penny equals 1 penny, according to the rules of current mathematics and multiplication. 1 penny times 1 penny equals 2 pennies, according to the laws of universal mathematics. One penny times one penny equals 0 0.0001. According to a calculator, a penny times a penny, 0 0.01 times 0 0.01 equals 0 0.001. Does a penny times a penny equal one penny based upon the rules of multiplication? Or does a penny times a penny equal 0 0.0001 based upon our current decimal system? A value so small that there isn't even a currency circulated for that amount by the US Department of Treasury. All calculations shown here are reasonable forms of multiplication, but which one remains consistent with observed universal phenomena? How would you like your money calculated? A nickel times a nickel equals what? A nickel is equivalent to 5 pennies. Then a nickel times a nickel should also equal a quarter. A nickel times a nickel according to the calculator is 0 0.05 times 0 0.05 equals 0 0.0025. Again, a value so small that there is not a currency circulated to represent it. How would you like your money calculated? A dime times a dime equals what? A dime is equivalent to 10 pennies. A dime times a dime should be equivalent to 10 pennies times 10 pennies. 10 pennies times 10 pennies is equivalent to 100 pennies, which is equal to a dollar. But a dime times a dime equals a penny according to a calculator. 0 0.10 times 0 0.10 equals 0 0.01. How would you like your money calculated? What is a quarter times a quarter? A quarter is equal to 25 pennies. Therefore, a quarter times a quarter equals 25 pennies times 25 pennies which equals 625 pennies, which is 6.25 US dollars. Yet a quarter times a quarter, according to the calculator, is 0 0.0625. 0 0.25 times 0 0.25 equals 0 0.0625. How would you like your money calculated? Allow me to enlighten you. If four over two is the inverse operation of two times two equaling four, 
then it would naturally follow that two divided by one or two over one is the inverse operation of one times one equaling two. So let's talk about this. What does your common sense tell you about these two scenarios? What do they have in common and what are their differences? Division. The number four is divided by two twice. And the truth is, the number two is divided by one twice. The proof of that, if you had $2 and split it between two people, you would have to give each person $1 in order for it to be even. In addition, two plus two equals four, and one plus one equals two. Subtraction, four minus two equals two, and two minus one equals one. Multiplication, two times two equals four, and one times one equals one. Does that make sense to anybody there? Does that seem like it's following any similar line of, of congruency? I mean, can you see where the mistake has occurred? Both of these scenarios are identical in every way. The only difference exists in dimension alone. If they add, subtract, and divide according to the same ratio, then they must also multiply according to the same ratio, plain and simple. If two over one is inconsistent with one times one equaling one, although four over two is consistent with two times two equaling four, then it should follow that two squared equals four, which it does, and one squared equals two. Yet the math and scientific community tells us that common sense and logic are wrong in this case because of a product of an arbitrary convention called the identity property. Let's discuss. In mathematics, an identity element or neutral element is a special element such as zero in the set of all integers under addition or one in the set of positive integers under multiplication, with a special set of powers that enables it the ability to defy the laws of physics on two of its primary founding assumptions. First of all, concerning the number one, in the case of 1 times itself, or any other number or variable, the end product is that same number or variable and that any number multiplied by a 0 equals a 0. As a result of this arbitrary rule, we are left with two false statements, two unnatural scenarios that makes it necessary for the fundamental laws of physics concerning action and necessary reaction, and the laws concerning the conservation of energy to be suspended in order for this identity rule to exist. One times one equaling one is paramount to an action times action without a reaction. In mathematics, an identity element or neutral element is a special type of element of a set with respect to a binary operation on that set, which leaves other elements unchanged when combined with them. Like a ghost or a shadowy influence upon nothing at all, yet it alters the natural course of any number it supposedly encounters. Therefore, in the case of 1, it is left without a mate, an equal and oppositely balanced condition because it remains unchanged when other ones are combined or attempt to simply multiply. A state of existence that is impossible in this universe of equilibrium. Because the rule of nature is to first divide accumulated matter by the process of radiation and expansion, which is the work of magnetism, and then to multiply that which has been divided through the process of centripetal gravitative contraction, which is the office of electricity. Secondly, on the identity of zero in multiplication, any number multiplied by zero will become a zero product. First thing, in order to multiply something by something else, they must be dimensionally equal. Then how do you make something dimensionally equal to nothing? The laws of conservation of energy might as well pack up and move away because how can a something multiplied by nothing cause the something to disappear? Remember, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Yet, in the case of multiplication, a process by which all things continue to exist and propagate their existence, zero behaves as a black hole of the number system that gobbles down anything that comes near it, a concept that doesn't exist except in outdated science fiction novels. How in the world have these two false statements been positioned as the unquestionable god rules of mathematics for the last 6,000 years? 
How deeply has this lie been interwoven into the very DNA of our approach to mathematics? A false axiom presented by an individual whose thoughts and ideologies have crafted our misinterpretation of the universe, which makes that person possibly the most influential person throughout all of history. We will now allow nature and the testimony of universal phenomena to answer these questions as we put this concept of the identity element to the test. With 1 times 1 equaling 1 and the future of mathematics weighing in the balance. 1 times 1 equals 1, or so we've been taught. We were taught around this very impressionable time that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny were also real. Yet, over the next few years, we ultimately came to terms with the fact that our chimneys were far too narrow for a jolly old fellow to climb down. The assertion that 1 times 1 equals 1 was implanted in our minds at a young, impressionable age, a time when questioning the accuracy of what we're taught isn't typical. As adults, however, our beliefs need to be grounded in strong, convincing arguments backed by natural phenomena, concrete evidence, and irrefutable facts. Every adult holds responsibility for their beliefs and the ideas they spread into the world, especially those that significantly impact our understanding of the universe. Therefore, Terence boldly challenges the long-held belief that 1 times 1 equals 1 proposing instead that 1 times 1 equals 2. This assertion is based on the premise that multiplication inherently means an increase in number or quantity. If the result doesn't show an increase, it defies the fundamental concept of multiplication. This is the undisputed definition of the word, to multiply. Terence Howard suggests that merely redefining multiplication or questioning the identity element in mathematics might not be enough to sway deeply rooted beliefs. He recognizes the challenge in altering a philosophy so integral to our world economy, pondering what it would take to enlighten this generation and steer them away from a path potentially misguided for over 6,000 years. Terence points out that multiplication, governed by the commutative and associative laws, essentially involves adding a number to itself as indicated by another number. He argues that by these laws, 1 times 1 should logically equal 2, challenging the conventional identity property, which he sees as suspending fundamental laws of motion. He invites us to consider what's more plausible, questioning observable physical phenomena or an arbitrary mathematical rule. Intriguingly, Terence notes that throughout history, no great thinker or observer of natural phenomena has ever reported 1 times 1 equating to 1, suggesting that nature doesn't conform to human mathematics. He finds it surprising that no one has publicly challenged this notion before, as it seems to have been ingrained in our minds from an early age, before we could discern truth from fiction. Terence Howard prompts us to question the fundamental principle of mathematics. How did we come to believe that an action times an action equals a non-reaction? He speculates on the potential repercussions in the mathematical and scientific communities if the identity element were proven false, questioning the stability of institutions built upon this foundational belief. The number one is the very first quantity of any measurable space, the lowest cardinal number, because half of two is one. Also, it encompasses all of the total potential energy within the entirety of what we call visible matter. In astrophysics, this is expressed in the notion of the singularity, where everything is compressed and represented within the quantity of the number one, singular. Now, there are many within the scientific community that would say, you cannot equate numerical values to physical occurrences. This is what Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson told me. They assert that the use of mathematics is more of a tool for measurement and not the measurement itself. The assertion is that the term singularity is not a literal term, but more of a concept and cannot be viewed as a quantity. To be perfectly honest, the entire notion of a singularity where all matter collapses upon itself and all the laws of physics breaks down is inconsistent with natural phenomena and lives more in the realm of science fiction than reality. 
Yet, many within the field of astrophysics firmly ascribe to this imaginative mathematical impossibility. What is this thing called one, and how can it or the concept of it be shrouded in so much mystery and controversy? The number one actually has the same foundational and patriarchal relationship with all other numbers that are descended from it. Just as the element hydrogen has with all other elements that occur after it, it just so happens to be the most abundant element within the known universe. In view of this relationship, let's compare our number sequence to the periodic table and the elements that make it up. In his insightful discussion on the periodic table of elements, Terence Howard delves into the foundational similarities between the structure of the universe and our mathematical systems. He begins with a profound statement. In our number system, all the numbers have something in common. Every number following the number one is a product of the number one. This assertion sets the stage for a compelling analogy between the simplicity and complexity of the universe's building blocks and the fundamental principles of mathematics. Look at what Terence says here about the human body and cells as an analogy for understanding complex systems from simple origins. This perspective is crucial because it encapsulates the essence of how complex forms emerge from simple beginnings. Just as the human body, a complex organism, is composed of trillions of cells, each serving different functions, yet originating from a common cellular structure, the universe's elements share a similar pattern of complexity from simplicity. Terence takes us further into the atomic level, explaining that atoms, the basic units of chemical elements, consist of protons, electrons, and neutrons. He highlights a crucial point. Every single element within the visible universe has a common ancestry with the element hydrogen. This statement is pivotal because it echoes his earlier point about the number one's role in mathematics. Just as all numbers derive from one, all elements can trace their lineage back to hydrogen, the simplest element. The periodic table, Terence explains, is not just a static chart of elements, but a dynamic predictor of atomic structures based on conditions such as motion and pressure. He uses the formation of ice as a metaphor to elucidate how conditions affect the state of matter, much like how environmental factors determine the state and behavior of elements like hydrogen. Terence's exploration of hydrogen's behavior under various conditions across the solar system serves as a masterclass in the adaptability and transformation of elements. He says, Under the limited influence of lower pressures from the sun in a more vacuous environment, hydrogen atoms expand and become more tenuous in their configurations. This adaptability is a testament to the universal principle of change based on environmental conditions a principle that applies both to the cosmos and to the foundational rules of mathematics. Now, consider Terence's critique of the identity property in mathematics, which posits that hydrogen multiplied by hydrogen would only yield hydrogen, contradicting the observable universe where elements combine and transform. This, according to Terence, illustrates a fundamental disconnect between mathematical principles and natural phenomena challenging the notion that 1 times 1 equals 1 when, in fact, nature demonstrates that combining elements, or numbers, can yield new, complex outcomes. Terence's discussions on diatomic hydrogen, H2, being the product of two hydrogen atoms, H times H equals H2, not merely adding but combining to form a new entity is particularly enlightening. It underscores his argument that the universe operates on principles of combination and transformation, principles that our mathematical systems should reflect to accurately describe the natural world. In essence, Terence Howard invites us to reconsider our understanding of the universe's fabric and the mathematical laws we use to describe it. He argues for a model that embraces the complexity and dynamism of nature suggesting that just as elements like hydrogen can combine and transform under varying conditions, our mathematical principles must also be adaptable and reflective of the universe's inherent complexity. This journey towards understanding the true nature of things, as Terence suggests, is not just a scientific or mathematical endeavor, but a profound exploration of the fundamental truths that govern our existence. In this intriguing exploration, Terence delves into the fascinating realm of light and perception, 
challenging our understanding of the universe and the mathematical principles we hold as truths. Let's break down his thought-provoking insights and see how they align with our agreement on his perspective. Terence starts with the simple question posed about the equation, 1 times 1 equals 1, drawing an analogy with a mirror to elucidate his point. He says, My second grade teacher told our class that, we should imagine that you are looking at the number 1 in the mirror. This analogy sets the stage for a deeper discussion on the nature of light and perception, urging us to question our fundamental understanding of multiplication and reflection. Look at what Terence says about light. Light is an effect of electromagnetic radiation that falls within a particular portion of the electro-slash-magnetic spectrum. He simplifies this complex phenomenon to its essence. Light enables us to see, yet our perception of it is incredibly limited, covering only about 0.0035% of the electromagnetic spectrum. This revelation is startling, as it metaphorically renders humanity almost blind in the universal context, depending heavily on a minuscule fraction of the spectrum for our understanding of the world around us. Terence's discussion extends to the limitations of human perception and the implications for our comprehension of the universe. Consequently, how much can we trust our view of our world and of the universe as a whole based upon this limited vision? He asks challenging the reliability of conclusions drawn from our constrained sensory experiences. This skepticism extends to the mathematical equations we use to define and understand our reality, including the fundamental equation E equals MC squared, which he interprets as illustrating that all things are light, everything just happens to be light, existing under different motion and pressure conditions. Mass and energy are both are both different manifestations of the same thing, a somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal to mc squared, in which energy is put equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy, and vice versa. The mass and energy were, in fact, equivalent. According to the formula mentioned above, this was demonstrated by Kokra and Walton in 1932 experimentally. One of the most compelling points Terence makes is about the crystallization of matter from light under varying conditions of pressure and motion. He explains, This occurs because light waves exert enormous pressure waves upon everything it encounters, which ultimately freeze and crystallize into every form of visible matter depending upon the pressure and motion conditions of that system. This perspective fascinatingly parallels the behavior of water under different temperatures and states, underscoring the transformative power of environmental conditions on matter. Perhaps the most revolutionary idea Terence presents is the notion that light, which many organisms consume directly or indirectly for energy, might itself be alive. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that since so many organisms feed directly from light, then perhaps light itself is also alive. This thought invites us to ponder the intrinsic nature of light and its role in the universe, challenging the boundaries between living and non-living entities. When discussing how light interacts with mirrors, Terence provides a compelling argument for reevaluating our understanding of multiplication. In order for us to see the number one in front of a mirror, we need to employ the use of light. Well, how does light interact with a mirror? If we were to place a candle in front of a mirror and used a light sensor, the measurement of light observed will be more than the light produced by one candle. This observation, that a mirror reflecting light creates an effect greater than the single source, serves as a metaphor for rethinking 1 times 1 equals 1. Through this lens, Terence suggests that 1 times 1 indeed equals more than just 1, urging a reconsideration of how we perceive and calculate the fundamental principles of our universe. Terence Howard's exploration into the nature of light and perception is not just an academic exercise, but a profound invitation to rethink the way we understand the universe and the mathematical laws we assume to govern it. 
His insights challenge us to expand our perspective beyond the limitations of our sensory experiences and the traditional frameworks of science and mathematics. In his exploration of sound and its wave dynamics, Terence Howard delves into the profound interconnectedness of sound, light, and the fabric of the universe. He challenges conventional scientific perspectives with compelling arguments, inviting us to reconsider how we perceive and understand the natural world. Terence introduces the concept with a powerful quote attributed to Pythagoras. A rock is nothing but frozen music. This idea, that a rock is essentially compressed sound waves with mass, weight, and dimension, sets a tone of wonder and curiosity. It suggests that everything around us, no matter how solid or inert it appears, is imbued with a kind of vibrational energy or music. Reflect on what Terence says about the nature of sound. If we say aloud, one times one, we have created two separate and distinct waveforms. He posits that these frequencies traverse the universe, touching everything in their path and altering every structure within both the visible and invisible realms. This perspective underscores the idea of universal connectivity, how a single vibration can resonate and adjust the balance across the cosmos, requiring potentially eons for the universe to equalize to new conditions. Terence's analogy of dropping a pebble into a lake to illustrate sound wave dynamics vividly captures the essence of vibrational impact. Just as ripples in a lake interact with their environment, sound waves, or our voices, in the lake of the universe perpetuate endlessly, influencing and being influenced by the cosmic fabric. Challenging a statement by Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Terence argues against the notion that sound cannot travel through the vacuum of space. He suggests that space is not a vacuum, but is filled with the most wonderful vibrating pre-atomic geometry. This assertion is crucial for understanding Terence's viewpoint that all things in the universe are interconnected, contradicting the idea of isolated systems. Terence intriguingly proposes that sound and light are fundamentally similar, differing only in their wave frequencies. This concept is beautifully illustrated by his explanation of converting sound frequencies to reveal their color within the visible light spectrum. Like Einstein said, everything is relative, Terence notes, emphasizing the interconnectedness and relativity of all phenomena. In discussing the propagation of sound through space, Terence critiques the limited vision of modern science, which fails to recognize the filled nature of what is perceived as a vacuum. He uses the example of a Geiger counter to illustrate that space, far from being empty, teems with subatomic particles and radiation, thereby facilitating the transmission of sound as variations in electromagnetic fields. Terence's exploration culminates in the assertion that by simply uttering one times one, we generate two distinct waveforms that will resonate through the universe for billions of years. This idea not only challenges our understanding of sound and light, but also invites us to contemplate the lasting impact of our actions and words on the cosmos. Then again, it could be argued that we are only thinking or imagining one times one. If so, let us now consider how thoughts are formed in the mind, and let's examine the hidden processes by which our brains do this thing called thinking. As information is funneled into the brain through various receptors located on the human body and are analyzed as thoughts, they are reborn as newly formatted electrical impulses. These impulses are different from the state by which they entered your sensory organs, because now they have been transmuted by your brain's narcissistic editorial process. It interprets all things according to its own image. Thoughts are generated inside a neuron, as told by modern science, as an electrical impulse, a frequency, that travels along the axion where it encounters a neural transmission fluid after which it is converted into electro-slash-chemical energy. Afterwards, it is carried through that fluid on a wave in its chemical state until it reaches the dendrites of a neighboring neuron where it converts again into electrical energy. Within this process of electrical energy being converted into chemical energy and back again into electrical energy, a measurable wave field is generated, and with each conversion, that wave field intensifies. The simple act of thinking or imagining one times one creates a large enough impulse that it can be measured through EEGs, electroencephalograms. 
EEGs are measurements of voltage fluctuations from electric wave motions within the neurons of the brain. Brainwave frequency is measured in hertz in the same manner that musical tones are measured. Therefore, if you think 1 times 1, you have created two separate waveforms, two separate songs of continually converting energy that travels from the brain through the skull and out into the universe where it can be interpreted by simple electronic measuring and monitoring devices. Those two thoughts about the multiplication of those two numbers creates two separate wave fields that will transfer their wave amplitude upon everything in existence until time indefinite. Therefore, even the act of thinking 1 times 1 creates at least two equal and opposite consequences. Each of them will have both a positive charge and a negative discharge, which in turn will have at the very least two separate and distinct consequences that will double into 4, and then 8, 16, 32, 64, etc. Do you see my point? Everything is affected by everything else. There aren't any isolated states of being where anything exists within a vacuum without the consequence of multi-dimensional chain reactions. Likewise, even the act of thinking 1 times 1, the consequences equal at least 2. If we were to take into consideration Newton's third law of motion, which states, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For if one times one ever equaled just one, then two forces or substances will have interacted without any reaction. Therefore, either Newton's third law is fundamentally flawed, or one times one must equal at the very least two. I'd like for you to take particular interest in Newton's ideas concerning mass and its attraction to other objects of mass. Within these concepts rest another obvious proof of 1 times 1 equals 2 in nature. Gravity which directly correlates to the mass of an object, as taught by modern science, is represented through values in our current number system. Examine, for instance, the tedious process of collecting data and the arduous task of processing that data. Do you recall how the human mind collects bits of information from multiple forms of stimuli? It is initially routed from the sensory organ to the thalamus, where it is converted into electrical impulses. Those impulses are then converted into chemical structures that represent the data. Remember that a chemical is composed of elements, and each element has a particular mass, and mass is determined through a consideration of force. In Newtonian terms, F is equal to MA. Nevertheless, if one mass times one mass equals only one mass, then there wouldn't be any such thing as the electrical effects that have been labeled as gravity to initially accumulate the matter into a mass. In fact, it would create the opposite effect of gravity for every mass would effectively repel every other mass. Our universe would never come into fruition. Therefore, in order for there to be the effect of gravity, one times one must equal at least two. Finally, I believe it is important that we drive the point home that there is a deliberate untruth woven throughout the fabric of our mathematics and is embedded within the programs that run our calculators, computers, and our smartphones. If you were to input the number 2 into your calculator and ask for its square root, you will receive the answer that we've mentioned numerous times before. 1.414213562373095 If you square that number, x squared, the calculator will tell you the answer is 2. But if you add that number to itself or multiply it by 2, the result is 1.414213562373095 plus 1.414213562 095 equals 2.828427124746190. Surprisingly, if you cube this result of the square root of 2, 1.414213562373095 cubed, according to the calculator, you'll get 2.828427124746190. Four, six, one, nine. Now wait a minute, that's the same number that you get by adding the number to itself. 1.414213562373095 plus 
1.414-213-562-373-095 equals 2.828427-1247-46190. How is it possible for a number, whether rational or irrational, to have the same exact value when being added to itself or being multiplied by 2 as it does when that number is cubed? The only other number in like manner is zero, because it is a non-number. Can this be a mistake? The truth is, 1 times 1 equals 2. And 1 times 1 equaling 1 isn't multiplication. It's a fabrication which is also known as a mathematical fallacy. Howard identifies irrationality, a condition where numbers cannot be expressed as simple fractions, as a significant flaw within mathematics. This flaw, as highlighted by Wildberger, suggests a dissonance in mathematics that many practitioners choose to ignore, despite its profound implications. Howard's discussion extends beyond a mere acknowledgement of this issue, venturing into the consequences of irrational numbers like pi and the square root of 2, especially when applied to natural phenomena. These numbers, essential to the Pythagorean theorem and the calculation of a circle's circumference, exemplify the clash between mathematical constructs and the observable universe's realities. At the heart of Howard's critique is the contention that Euclidean geometry and its derivatives, rooted in the concept of straight lines and perfect shapes like the platonic solids, fail to capture the universe's inherently curved nature. He argues that reliance on these linear models has led to a stalemate of reasoning, where the tools we use to describe the universe no longer align with its true structure. The universe, Howard posits, is a living and breathing entity characterized by cycles of expansion and contraction that cannot be accurately represented by static, linear mathematical models. Howard advocates for a paradigm shift in how we approach mathematics and its application to the physical sciences. He suggests that the natural world, with its regular and predictable cycles, should dictate our mathematical models rather than abstract constructs that fail to mirror reality. This approach necessitates abandoning the notion of straight lines and embracing the curvature that defines space and time. The all-shape and tetratarian wave state, as introduced by Howard, offer alternative models that better reflect the universe's curved and dynamic nature. The call to redefine our mathematical understanding of the universe has far-reaching implications. It challenges centuries of scientific thought and practice, requiring a re-evaluation of everything from the fundamental laws of physics to the technologies we develop and rely on. Howard's critique extends to the educational system, which perpetuates these outdated models, and the broader scientific community, which has been slow to recognize and address these foundational issues. Howard's analysis, grounded in the discrepancies between Euclidean geometry and the universe's true nature, invites us to reconsider our approach to understanding the cosmos. By embracing a model of the universe that accounts for its inherent curvature and dynamism, we can unlock a more accurate and holistic understanding of reality. This shift, while challenging, holds the promise of aligning our scientific pursuits with the natural laws that govern the universe, leading to new discoveries and advancements in our quest to comprehend the cosmos. In The Conditions of One, Terence Howard embarks on a philosophical and scientific exploration of the concept of one, delving into its structure and significance in the universe. He intertwines concepts from physics, mathematics, and metaphysics to present a nuanced understanding of one as both the cumulative product of all things and the smallest reflection of the whole. Terence begins by referencing Albert Einstein's concept of a quanta, or quantum, situating his discussion within the realm of multidimensional space slash time. He asserts that to perceive or measure the three known dimensions, height, width, and depth, a separate and distinct dimensional plane of observation is necessary. Thus, Terence argues, there are at the very least four necessary dimensions for anything to exist within the visible universe. This perspective challenges the traditional three-dimensional viewpoint and suggests a more complex structure of existence. Consider what Terence says about the nature of light. 
Light was the fastest known substance within the visible universe until Birkeland currents indicated that information in the electric currents traveled at speeds far superior to light. He uses this to segue into a discussion on how light, due to the curvature of space slash time, ultimately curves back onto its original position, completing a circuit. This understanding of light leads to the concept of the all shape, which Terence believes is the proper geometric representation of the reflection of one. Terence's concept of the all shape is particularly intriguing. He describes it as the system created where four expanding spheres intersect forming a structure he calls a tetratarian wave state. This structure, according to Terence, represents the interconnected nature of all things within the universe. Furthermore, Terence discusses how all visible matter in the universe occurs within the confines of the vesica piscis of interacting and intersecting planes. He emphasizes, all things are one. This statement encapsulates the essence of his argument, that at the core of all things, the laws governing the simplest element, hydrogen, dictate the geometry of its byproducts and shapes, which are all interconnected. In his examination of matter, Terence notes that all matter is both expanding and contracting as per a universal prime directive of existence. He elaborates, all matter must be congruent with all other matter, meaning everything has a common denominator and can be reduced to its lowest term. This idea of congruence and commonality leads to his assertion that the common factor, or quanta, of our universe is the structure of one. Understanding this structure, he suggests, unifies all things. Through his unique lens, Terence invites us to view the universe not as a collection of disparate parts, but as a cohesive whole, where every element, every wave, and every particle is intrinsically connected to form the singular reality of one. This exploration is not just a scientific or mathematical analysis, it's a philosophical reflection on the unity and interconnectedness of all existence. 1. We know the definition alone that to multiply means to make many or manifold, to actually increase the number or quantity. Therefore, it must increase in size and quantity, or it is not multiplication. Consequently, 1 times 1 equals 1 could never be a part of the multiplication table because it fails to satisfy the definition of the term to multiply. So, by definition alone, we have clear and rational proof that 1 times 1 can never equal just 1. We also know that 1 times 1 equaling 1 is a false answer because the associative and commutative laws were not properly followed, which left an unfinished and unbalanced equation. Also. The identity property has thus been shown to be based upon an uninformed, biased, and arbitrary preconception that has no relative value in light of observed natural phenomena. 2. Although it is an acceptable phenomenon in the mathematic community for the square root of a number less than 1 when added to itself to be greater than the initial number squared, we are discussing the number 2, and its square root when added to itself should never exceed the initial number for that would be highly irregular and completely unacceptable, even in the loose-fitting constraints of the laws of our current system of mathematics. This anomaly is not acceptable for anything that exists within the physical universe beyond our flawed system of mathematics, meaning that no other system or organism within our known universe behaves as our numeric system. Where one is massless, weightless, without spin, and lacking of any measurable effects when it interacts with itself or any other number that is derived from it, this ultimately prevents the square root of 2 from having the natural and logical answer of 1. Remember, an object must be equal to the sum of its parts, it cannot be greater than nor less than itself. This is just simple common sense. Therefore. The square root of any given number when added to itself should never exceed the initial number. If it does, then we have overreached and the true square root of that number has failed to be satisfied. 3. Newton's uncontested third law states, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, 1 times 1 equaling 1 is a violation of every natural law regarding cause and effect within the known universe. Consequently, 1 times 1 must equal, at the very least, 2. 4. 
the Pythagorean theorem postulates that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This, unfortunately, corners mathematics into a stalemate of short-sighted reasoning because the side and the diagonal of the square become incommensurable if both sides are positive integers. 5. Euclidean geometry gave birth to the Platonic solids, which were constructed with straight intersecting lines that do not exist in our universe of curved space slash time. Attempting to describe our world and the underlying structure of the universe by straight lines seems as futile an attempt as someone trying to capture the complexities of the entire human anatomy with stick figures. It produces only a crude depiction of the true reality. Remember, all energy in the universe is expressed in motion, and all motion is expressed in waves, and all waves are a function of a vortex, a spinning whirlpool, and all vortex functions are curved. There are no straight lines in the universe, therefore, there aren't any straight lines in universal mathematics. So there you have it, five logic-provoking, reliable witnesses that testify to the unreasonable and illogically flawed basis that governs man's thinking upon these matters and is also the foundation of our system of multiplication. Money can be multiplied, or can it? Money can be multiplied by a number but can it be multiplied by itself? Terence Howard critically examines the transition from a gold-based monetary system to a fiat system, exploring its implications on the nature of money and its multiplication. His analysis touches on both the mathematical and conceptual aspects of currency, challenging the traditional notions of value and multiplication in the context of modern economics. Terence starts by posing an intriguing question. Money can't be multiplied, or can it? He then delves into the foundational principles of mathematics, reminding us that everything has a common denominator and can be reduced to its lowest terms. This approach, he suggests, should apply to money as well, arguing that if the monetary value can be made equal to the number it's being multiplied by, then theoretically, money can be multiplied. Look at what Terence says about the nature of money in the modern economy. Our paper money isn't a convenient representation of anything except that of a very vivid imagination because our currency is no more valuable than the paper that it is printed upon. This statement highlights the crux of his argument about the fiat system. The US dollar, once anchored to the gold standard, offered a tangible value. However, post its detachment from gold, it became a virtual entity susceptible to manipulation and devoid of a solid backing. Terence explains the historical context of this shift, citing President Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1933 mandate and President Nixon's 1971 decision to officially take the U.S. off the gold standard. He illustrates how these actions led to a global shift towards fiat currencies, essentially transforming them into digital markers in a binary system, devoid of intrinsic value. This transformation, according to Terence, has profound implications. When the world governments cease to base their currencies upon hard assets, at that moment all currency became nothing more than virtual digital markers. He argues that in such a system, money becomes an abstract concept, easily manipulated and multiplied within the confines of a computer program, much like imaginary numbers in mathematics. Terence also touches on the concept of fractionalization in currency, highlighting how the value of a dollar can vary based on its subdivision into smaller units like quarters or pennies. This variability, he suggests, further complicates the notion of a stable, unified value for money. This is a call to re-examine our understanding of value, currency, and the principles of multiplication in the context of a global economy that has moved away from tangible assets. Through this exploration, Terence challenges us to rethink the nature of money and its role in our society, highlighting the complexities and potential pitfalls of a system increasingly detached from physical reality. Now that I've explained one way that money can be multiplied and some historical examples, would you like to see what could be possibly taking place behind the hidden walls of the financial world? A penny times a penny equals what? Since the penny is no longer based upon the hard asset of gold and is now based upon an imaginary value that is equal to a virtual value of the integers or numbers, then it follows one penny times one penny equals one penny, according to the rules of current mathematics and multiplication. One penny times one penny equals two pennies, 
according to the laws of universal mathematics. One penny times one penny equals 0 0.0001. According to a calculator, a penny times a penny, 0 0.01 times 0 0.01 equals 0 0.0001. Does a penny times a penny equal one penny based upon the rules of multiplication? Or does a penny times a penny equal 0 0.0001 based upon our current decimal system? A value so small that there isn't even a currency circulated for that amount by the US Department of Treasury. All calculations shown here are reasonable forms of multiplication, but which one remains consistent with observed universal phenomena? How would you like your money calculated? A nickel times a nickel equals what? A nickel is equivalent to five pennies. Then a nickel times a nickel should also equal a quarter. A nickel times a nickel according to the calculator is 0 0.05 times 0 0.05 equals 0 0.0025. Again, a value so small that there is not a currency circulated to represent it. How would you like your money calculated? A dime times a dime equals what? A dime is equivalent to 10 pennies. A dime times a dime should be equivalent to 10 pennies times 10 pennies. 10 pennies times 10 pennies is equivalent to 100 pennies, which is equal to a dollar. But a dime times a dime equals a penny according to a calculator. 0 0.10 times 0 0.10 equals 0 0.01. How would you like your money calculated? What is a quarter times a quarter? A quarter is equal to 25 pennies. Therefore, a quarter times a quarter equals 25 pennies times 25 pennies which equals 625 pennies, which is 6.25 US dollars. Yet a quarter times a quarter, according to the calculator, is 0 0.0625. 0 0.25 times 0.25 equals 0 0.0625. How would you like your money calculated? As you can clearly see, for all of our unfortunate lives, and for most of mankind's chaotic existence upon this planet under the false banner of a civilized society we've been. If I may borrow a phrase or two from the legendary civil rights leader, Malcolm X, we've been misled, bamboozled, we've been had, hoodwinked, conned, taken advantage of, taken for a ride around the proverbial block, taken to the cleaners, and we've been taken to the bank, literally. The British just so happened to have a phrase that they used to describe someone who is short-sighted and a tad bit slow when it comes to finances. They call it being penny-wise and pound-foolish. Unfortunately, that describes 99.9% .9 of the past and present populations of the world. Nevertheless, the proverbial buck stops here, all pun intended.